welcome everyone to the inaugural event of the Swiss chapter of Women in Global Health. I see people are slowly arriving to this webinar. It is really our great pleasure to, to welcome everyone here. Um, yeah, my name is Carmen Sant. I am a scientific collaborator and health systems researcher at Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, but I am also, and it is my great pleasure to say this, one of the co-chairs of the Swiss chapter of Women in Global Health, together with Gabriel landry Shapui and Michaela Told and Helen Pritterk, we have organized this inaugural event. And it's really fantastic to have reached this step. So thanks to everyone that was involved in this. We have a really exciting one and a half hours ahead of us. So I hope, yeah, you all have turned your phones off and are ready to enjoy and engage in this, in this session. We are looking forward um, to lots of comments, ideas, and hopefully this is only the beginning of a wonderful collaboration in Switzerland. Gabriel will be explaining in a minute a bit more of how this Swiss chapter came to being. Then we will have Rupadat, which is also great to have you here, um, explaining a bit more of women in global health as the founder of women in global health, this movement, as well as kind of why is the Swiss chapter so relevant and so exciting to have this um, starting. And then after that, we will have a round table with five fantastic experts. And it's really an honor to have you all here. So again, thanks everyone. Um, for joining, explaining a little bit of their personal journeys in, in global health. And last but definitely not least, you will hear a little bit more of some of the people behind the work streams of Women in Global Health um, Switzerland. And it will not only be a session where you can hear, but hopefully we can also um, get to brainstorm a little bit with everyone um, on what those work streams should be doing, what are the priorities and how we may move forward. Um, we are, as mentioned, we, this is a webinar, but we're still hoping to get a lot of ideas and interactions with everyone. So we have the chat function for all of you to just use. I see already someone saying um, that they're excited to be here. So please use the chat as much as you want and can. We are going to be hosting the event in English, but you're welcome to join and interact in French, German or Italian, as well as in English. We can cover those languages, unfortunately. Um, we could only do it in English today. There's also the live transcript option that you can activate in case you need that, if it will help facilitate with the um, um, yeah, understanding. And last but definitely not least, I will post in a second in the chat as well how you can engage in the platform. So we are hoping this will be the first interaction and kind of live interaction, but all of this will be moving to the Women in Global Health Switzerland platform. So please join us and enjoy this session. With this, over to you, Gabrielle. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Carmen. It's such a pleasure to be co-chairing uh, Women in Global Health Switzerland with you and with the core group of, of busy women that we've been working with uh, so, so arduously. Um, so it's actually with immense pleasure um, and also with firm resolve, um, and I would say even a little bit of a sense of sobering reality that we thank and welcome all of you uh, today to this launch of Women in Global Health Switzerland. I think we've all been reminded of the absolute importance of women taking decisions in global health and public health and also in their own health. Um, and so, you know, today is a, is a really important day for us. Um, we're here as a movement. We're here as a group of busy people working in health and global health and public health. And we're a group of volunteers. Um, and I think what brings us together today is our, is our sort of engagement in some of the most pressing health issues of our lives and of our times. So Women in Global Health Switzerland has been years in the making. So while we're having our inaugural event today, I think many of you will agree that most of us here working in global health in Switzerland have been scratching our heads over the years going, why don't we have a Women in Global Health Swiss chapter on top of the many more than 40 chapters all around the world um, that, that, that exist today? Um, and I think when Michaela told and I, you know, first started thinking about this and getting support from Rupa Dot on, on, on thinking this through, we decided no longer to ask ourselves the question of why is there no chapter? We decided to say, how can we make this happen and when can we make this happen? And so with the support of many of you, the how turned into as best as we can. 
and the win is basically now. And so even though we have been discussing this for years, today is the day that we really start and we're ready to really get engagement from all of you. And so what we ask is that we consider this the real time that we start shaping women in global health Switzerland together. And so what we'll ask is that you, you know, join us in however you can, whether that be in giving your time or giving your support or partnering with us or thinking things through. And so that's what we really ask of you all today. And we're so thankful that you're with us. And so in the early days when we were discussing women in global health Switzerland, which is in a particular position within global health, we decided with support from Rupa and support from Women in Global Health Global that there would be two aspects to this chapter. One is really supporting all of the global initiatives of women in global health um, for reasons that I think we don't even need to explain. But on the other hand, we really wanted a Swiss focus. And so that is what we're going to start talking through today to make sure that we really have embedment in Swiss health, public health, across public and private sectors, and also the global health, um, the global health community. So while we're all speaking English today, we hope that in the future we will be having events in the different languages and in the different regions of Switzerland. It will take us time to build that, but that's also you know, why we're here today to kickstart this whole process. And so just thinking about that support, uh, that notion of support, I turn now to Dr. Rupa Dot, um, who has given us so much of her support and also that of Women in Global Health Global to get where we are today. And so it's with great joy that, uh, that I really present to you Rupa Dot, uh, who is a medical doctor. You probably all know her. Uh, she's the executive director of Women in Global Health Global and also the co-founder. So it's with great pleasure now that I turn the floor over to you, Rupa. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. And it is really with great pleasure to join all of you for this very special chapter launch and seeing so many familiar faces. I really wish I uh, could have uh, been there um, in person and uh, you know joined um, as all of this energy comes together. It is a very special moment um, to see the Women in Global Health Switzerland chapter launch. Uh, I would say that it's a much awaited chapter and a lot of the work of women mobilizing, women who are leading and working in, in global health in Switzerland has been long before even Women in Global Health came into town. Um, so it is um, great to see very familiar faces, especially uh, Professor Alona Cake Bush, who you will all be hearing from as well, who's been critical um, to forming the community in Switzerland. Um, and at the same time, as I join all of you, I'm, I'm um, tuning in from Washington, uh, D.C. Um, it is also with mixed feelings of disappointment and anger. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, seeing what has really happened here in the United States um, at the post um, dawn of after Roe versus uh, Wade has been reversed. Uh, it's a stark reminder. I was uh, protesting on Friday or, and over the weekend. And it's a, it's a reminder that women's rights are under constant struggle. They're being negotiated often by a privileged few, often only by men or men majority, and that progress really cannot be taken for granted. And that's why exactly communities like Women in Global Health, the community that all of you are forming, are so critical to making sure that progress is happening in, uh, in the local realities as we continue to negotiate for global norms. At the same time, um, uh, this past weekend, um, being um, in, in, among protesters, hundreds of them, um, it, it was also at the same time seeing this polarization. It's also a reminder that, you know, again, communities coming together created a platform for discussion, um, an opportunity um, to really uh, coalesce and uh, come together and say, you know, together we can have collective action and fight for women's rights. And so at the same time, it's been also energizing um, and knowing that the fight must continue and we're not um, alone. And particularly, um, you know, the, the rollback that happened here in the United States is incredibly relevant um, to global discussions that are happening in, um, in the global fora. Um, already there has been a uh, witnessing of what was um, uh, impacting women's rights agenda when there was a very conservative government in the United States um, leading. But we also know that in Europe, many countries 
countries are seeing similar um, uh, things uh, take place where women's access to abortion um, has been limited or um, there's debates going on on what women's rights should really look like. And so uh, what's happening here in the United States, what I'm witnessing is not something that is you know, only unique um, to our country, but it is something that is happening across the world. And, and for Switzerland, I think very relevant what's happening in European continent and, and seeing um, that we need to have such communities to really um, join and fight back and continue to push progress forward. So as I join all of you, I'm coming in with mixed feelings, but I'm feeling incredibly energized about this community coming together. And as Gabrielle said, it's been long in the works um, and it is uh, an opportunity to really think about um, how do we um, take advantage of all the uniqueness of what the Switzerland community brings. Uh, I was asked to reflect on two points today. So the first one is really, you know, why did we choose uh, to build a movement instead of an international organization, uh, especially given um, global health um, community and multi-stakeholders? Uh, one might wonder why not just, uh, you know, form another NGO or have another conference or uh, launch a special initiative. And you know, the story really goes back to, and I have to say, uh, you know, sharing this uh, with uh, Alona on the call is really special in, in the sense that um, uh, Alona launched a, a social media hashtag called WGH100. Uh, it is still on Twitter, so I recommend you all check it out. Um, but in, in global health, there were too many conversations happening without women. We already know that was happening in decision making rooms, um, but public events, um, conferences, panels and uh, and Alona started a hashtag to say, well, you know, there's no excuse for having all male discussions or all male decision making when there's so many talented women working in global health. And at that time, I was um, early career, I had just um, finished medical school was getting ready um, uh, in, in clinical training, getting ready to graduate. And I remember coming uh, to Alona and saying, what's going to come next after this, you know, it was, it was almost that moment, that spark um, from that social media hashtag that there was so much energy from all, all around the world, so many women um, that spoke up and, and, um, and nominated themselves, nominated their colleagues, that that list went from being at 100 to 200 to 300. And I know Michaela and Eleanor were both working on this at the Graduate Institute. And it was that conversation that, you know, Yes, you know, at the same time, while we, we do have this really important catalytic moment, we need to do more than um, just call out the issue. We really need to mobilize. Um, and so it was really those um, early uh, moments of uh, building up um, energy um, that we, you know, came to uh, uh, the World Health Assembly that happens in May and is hosted um, in, in Switzerland and in International Geneva. And it was at a coffee table. We gathered thought leaders from all different backgrounds age groups, um, different stakeholders. And we asked them that question, where do we go from here? And we asked the question of, you know, do we launch an organization? Um, do we have a global conference? Um, do we become uh, a network? And one common area that resonated with everyone is that what we really need is collective action. And that is why Women in Global Health um, decided that, you know, what makes the most sense is for us to push for collective action um, and create uh, create a movement. And movements, as you know, uh, have to be organic. They have to be locally uh, led and they have to be driven by local interest, passion, energy, fuel. And as Gabrielle has mentioned, Women in Global Health has been volunteer fueled from its early days. We now have a, a small core staff um, that supports the global movement, but there are 40 plus chapters around the world, majority of them fueled by volunteer um, uh, energy, because it is exactly a key ingredient for our movement. At the same time, when we look at what's unique to a movement, um, it is the opportunity um, to work together collectively. And um, we talk a lot about collective action, and that is the power of numbers, um, uh, the power of coming together uh, as key moments in, in time have shown us that uh, it really takes communities and often groups of women coming together to push for the gender equality and women rights agenda. Um, it's also an opportunity to learn um, from local 
context from uh, national realities um, and, and create much more of a sustainable organic and grassroots um, effort because change in gender equality, as you all have heard those numbers, estimates go anywhere from 100 years to 200 years, 250 years when we look at how long it's going to take us to achieve gender equality. And it is really through um, collective action, groups coming together that we can uh, take those numbers and cut them, uh, divide them by by 10, uh, you know, get them into lower lower numbers. And it's also an opportunity for us to, to do things differently and to embrace the diversity of women and the diversity of people, but really the diversity across generation, um, stakeholders, uh, different uh, cultural uh, identities, um, um, it is really through this community that we can understand um, these aspects. And in Women in Global Health, we talk about doing things differently. And often that includes applying a power and privilege lens and looking at these multiple identities uh, where women exist and that influence their power and their ability to transform their environment. Um, so that is, again, something unique that a movement really creates space for that. Um, and as, as we sort of talk about the opportunities um, and, and uniqueness of the Women in Global Health uh, Switzerland chapter, the second question I was um, asked to reflect on, I have to acknowledge that the work has been happening already for such a long time. And we're um, standing on the legacy of many women who have um, been leading and uh, working in global health and challenging for gender equality and women's leadership in international uh, Geneva, um, as well as influencing um, uh, local policy and national policy and global health agenda of, of Switzerland. Uh, as well as women in global health, we've had some historical moments. Not only did we launch in Switzerland, um, but the very first women leaders dinner um, that we organized around um, the World Health Assembly took place in Switzerland. Um, and together with the Graduate Institute, we um, brought together uh, member states, um, uh, uh, multilateral organizations, um, international NGOs, and other stakeholders um, to really do a gender equality check and mobilize in the early days. Um, we influenced the WHO Director General elections um, collectively to Together, and we've had uh, a, a rich range of partners, um, and it's great to see here Ambassador Nora, uh, who I've had the pleasure to meet on uh, numerous occasions, and she's um, collaborated and met with Women in Global Health um, globally many times to brainstorm and to hear our concerns, and um, so we or have a, a rich history of also collaborating with the Swiss government. Um, and then particularly, Switzerland itself is, is a unique um, player in global health. Um, it is is very influential. It is the host of uh, many of um, the most influential global health organizations. Um, it is the second um, uh, largest donor of UN women. And then it has um, a vast um, uh, rich history in medical, um, public health, um, and other uh, you know, health aspects, including hosting many of the private sector pharmaceutical industry. So there's so many actors in Switzerland um, and, and the Swiss, the Swiss uh, government government itself being a key actor in global health and broader development, that these are all opportunities um, for the Swiss chapter to really engage and bring these diverse perspectives together. Um, and so as I talk about the opportunity and hand it back to all of you to really define what your priorities will be, how you will co collaborate, um, we at the uh, international uh, community are really looking forward to connecting you um, with other uh, women in global chapters, really, really looking forward to seeing how you will work together, how you will build partnerships um, in Europe, but also um, have um, uh, partnerships with other chapters since we have chapters in all regions. And um, and really, you know, uh, encourage all of you to be advocates, um, to use evidence to drive the policy change, um, and know that you have allies uh, in other countries, you have allies uh, uh, nationally, and uh, let's be innovative, bold, and continue to um, 
challenge uh, those that want to push back women's rights. This is the time that we must take and channel the rage that we have of seeing the setback or the fact that progress is so delayed and work together uh, to push for that project uh, progress. And so on that note, I'd like to turn it back um, to Gabrielle, but really a special thanks to all of you that have been um, critical to uh, finding this community. And um, and I know each one of you will, will be fueling it. And um, again, a special thanks to Gabrielle and Michaela for bringing all of us together. Looking forward to meeting all of you, which I know our pathways will uh, cross many times and we'll continue to plot together uh, to again, push for gender equality and women's rights. Thank you so much, Rupa. Thank you for getting us all really focused on the task. Um, and we here at Women in Global Health Switzerland are, are ready to take up the task. And, and, and thank you for so much for being here with us today and for inspiring us today and, and always. So um, it's with this now that I will turn actually over to Mikaela, who will be moderating the, the roundtable discussion. Um, so thank you so much and over to you, Mikaela. Yeah, thank you, Gabrielle. And thank you, Rupa, for, for being with us. Thank you for all the panelists to be with you and for all the participants. I hope we can show that passion and that energy, what in fact women in global health as a movement is all about. And so let's get going with this round table. And my name is Michaela Toll. So I'm, I've been with this journey with, with Gabrielle, but also with all the women here, women here in the room and many actually um, in, in the audience as well. And I'm very glad that I can moderate this panel now today. Um, a very esteemed panel that we actually have Ambassador Nora Gonik Romero with us, the Vice President and Member of Senior management as well as head of international affairs from the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health. Ilona Kikbush, whom you all know, I'm sure, Global Health expert and chairperson of the International Advisory Board of the Global Health Center at the Credit Institute. Sonia Merten, head of unit of the Society Gender and Health um, at the Swiss EPH. Samuel Hurst, Welcome also Director of the Institute of Ethics, History and Humanities at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Geneva. And then also Ava Dubese Epine, a student of medicine and member of the Gender and Equity Working Group at the University of Geneva. So these are our panelists. And, and what I will do is just um, thank you so all for joining here. And I will moderate this in a conversational style. So we will not have lectures one by the other, but we, I'd like to actually ask you some questions. And my first round is really that I'd like to hear a little bit about your personal experiences. I want to get to know you, we want to get to know you, as you also, most of you are very prominent here in Switzerland, we know you all, but we don't know everything about you. So let me start and ask uh, this, Ambassador Nora Konik Romero. Nora, thank you for joining. And you have been appointed as the, the as head of international affairs in 2017, back in 2017. And as such, you're actually heading the delegation to the World Health Assembly. And during the COVID-19, you have been also headed, you also headed the working group to ensure that Switzerland had sufficient vaccines available for its population. So these are really prominent functions. And women in global health is about women in leadership. It's about challenging power and privilege. So we are actually interested to hear from you about your experiences in these leadership positions. What have been your challenges as a women leader here in Switzerland? Well, thank you, Michaela, for the question and uh, nice to, to see all of you, at least virtually. I, I hope you can hear me. I'm uh, multitasking again, so I'm on my way between two meetings and uh, I hope it's uh, fine with the technical dimension. Um, I'm actually happy that you formulated the question the way you did, because on what I had received in preparation, the question was, what do you take as a woman leader? And I, I always take those questions as questions that we shouldn't ask each other because to discuss about what it is being a woman leader, but just what it is about being a leader. Um, and joke aside, um, I, I always um, 
feel that it's a good time to reflect on what we lived in the last two years. You said that I started in 2017. I would never have imagined that I would be uh, so involved in, in managing uh, such, an, such a crisis. And I have to say that the, the most important thing I take with me on my path is the importance of resilience. And um, I, I do feel that the hardest part um, is to, to find the energy and to still be on top of things and to take right decisions or wrong decisions and stick to them. Um, and all that uh, in such a long time frame. And so for me, the most important part of the experience of the two last years is, is resilience and how to find the necessary energy to, to do the right thing, or at least try to do the right thing um, over such a long period of time. Nora, can I just maybe just ask a, a very short question in follow up to that? As you say, it's about energy, it's about resilience. So how did you get that energy? Um, family, uh, trying to reflect, building a good team, uh, ask for help when it's too much. Um, and then to be quite honest, I don't know if I always cope with that uh, well. I feel that uh, putting so much in has also come with a price. And to a certain extent, I think that uh, talking about it, trying to get uh, to, to keep on moving and doing the right thing is probably uh, one of the motivation. Thank you so much, Nora, for being so open with us here. And so let me just move to, to Ilona. Ilona, you are really a well-known global health expert. You have been very long in the field. You have just an amazing energy as well. As it seems, it goes on and goes on and on. And so, but you have been also very instrumental in setting up Women in Global Health Global. And of course, you have been also engaged in Women in Global Health Germany when they started, so a, a neighboring you know, chapter we are looking at as well. And you are supporting us now. And you, I, I have looked, of course, we all also follow, I guess, you on social media and then Twitter, and we see that, that you call yourself always a feminist. So why is it that for you that you are engaging in that, why do you call yourself always a feminist? Can you tell us a little bit the story here? Well, that's quite simple because I am, and uh, it's been since my student days. You know, I started. Uh, well, I would say even in my school days, and uh, it became quite clear that I had certain ambitions. And when I looked around, I saw that it was only men who were in the positions that you know were part of my ambition. For example, I started out in a very female job. Uh, which was to be a librarian. And uh, then I said, well, you know, I'd really like to lead a large library. And then it looked around and then it was, uh, the leaders were all men and they all had university degrees. And so off I went to get a university degree. And uh, then I ended up in the students movement and that was full of men. And then I studied political science and that was full of men. And then I went to the World Health Organization and that was full of men. And so that gave me a certain amount of practice. Uh, but uh, what was always at the heart of what I did and gave me the energy and the strength in relation also to what Nora said, was that in a way I'd been socialized in a movement. And for me, it was never only an individual issue or uh, when you know I experienced um, resistance, uh, it was never just the feeling that I'm failing, but it was always you know, a sort of understanding to have to change power and politics. And uh, so that understanding of power that obviously also comes from my discipline, uh, political science, has always been the, the driving force uh, for what I do. And having been in a movement, uh, when uh, I find something's not going the way it should, I try to find people who think the same way 
and to try and find some mechanism to create a dynamics to move things forward. And uh, that uh, finally, you know, at that point led to that Twitter campaign. We were working together at the Graduate Institute then and you supported it so much. So uh, those are the kinds of things. So it's just an integral part of me. You know, it's, uh, I've never questioned it. It's just what I am. Some people, you know, say, oh, you're a 1968 feminist and that's out of date. But I mean, it's me. And uh, that's how I run my life. And uh, that's how I do the things I do professionally. And it's great that you are as you are. <laughs> and I want to pick up on the power and politics because I think it really is also about society. And that really makes me to move to Sonia Merton because you are heading the unit on gender, society and, and health at the Swiss TPH. And so you're conceptualizing gender also as a social cultural determinant of health. So, and I imagine that such a transdisciplinary research you are involved cannot be just shaped about an academic gap, cannot be just the academic, cannot be just the, because there's a gap, because there is an academic interest. I just feel that must be more than that. There must be, you know, also a personal interest in there. So what made you to focus on this area of research around, you know, the society and gender and health? Uh, thank you very much, Michaela, for this question. Actually, um, first I was a little bit surprised, but uh, I see that it fits in very nicely with the <laughs> previous um, um, discussion <laughs> that, that um, you now had uh, with um, Ilona Kikbush. Um, so actually, it, it is a very personal um, history or, uh, it, that I have. I, I come from a family um, that, ha that is very diverse in terms of uh, family backgrounds, ethnicities and cultural backgrounds as well. Um, and uh, also, um, there has been a feminist um, tradition in my family at the same time. So, I quickly understood that our um, Eurocentric uh, feminist um, perspective is not all there is. There is a certain mismatch also um, when I think of um, my um, family members from uh, coming from, um, from, from the African continent actually, um, not really, um, who, who don't really see and understand um, what it is to be a woman uh, in the current uh, society. Um, it doesn't mean the same in, in, in every context. So I got uh, actually um, more interested really also in what um, this means for a person's experience. What is the, the lived experience people have um, when they live in completely different contexts and uh, societies, when they um, live in societies with different ontologies and different um, epistemologies as well, the way they create knowledge about their surrounding. Um, so power relations and power um, questions, they are very important for me too, but I kind of um, went the other way around looking at the, um, at the people um, on the ground and their experiences in the focus of my research. Actually, after um, um, some time in uh, working in public health, um, also with WHO for a short time, uh, I decided to do a PhD and um, I had the chance to be supervised by a medical anthropologist, um, which um, kind of uh, brought me really to broaden um, also my um, scientific um, skills and perspectives. And um, I must say, I think I learned that um, uh, a woman's agency um, must be seen really in the wider historically grown context, uh, considering social norms, power structures, but also kinship structures. So the way uh, the societies are differently organized, conceptualizations of uh, reciprocal obligations and so on, uh, it reaches far beyond the individual um, empowerment. So it is not only about an individual grasping power, it is more about interaction um, and um, also um, changing institutions. 
Um, so um, what I also learned in this um, in this phase during my PhD and after is that um, without local context, okay, that's a, a no-brainer, without knowledge about the local context, you cannot do successful public health interventions. Uh, but how can you get this knowledge? I think we really need to also move from research on people to, or for people to research with people. We need to engage, to, to engage with, um, with, our, with communities um, we want to work with and um, uh, engage in, so to say, in transdisciplinary research involving um, different stakeholders, including the target people of public health interventions. Um, so maybe if I can just uh, bring it back to what that uh, may mean for women in global health, I think we need to be careful that we're inclusive of different voices of women also here in Switzerland so that we are mirroring the diversity in backgrounds, also in terms of educational background, class, social class, needs and interests of the diverse women in Switzerland. So I, I think it shouldn't be only about leaders. It should also be about who can participate and speak out and who is heard. Great, thank you, Sonia. So it's great to bring in also the people, the relationships, but also you actually pointed out the context and the, the historical context historical, but also the context in which we live. So that is also a good moment maybe to come to Samya Her. Samya, thank you for joining us here. You're of course a very world renowned bioethics expert. You're serving on many different expert committees nationally, internationally. You're also the director of the Institute of Ethics, History and Humanities here at the Faculty of Medicine in, in, at the Uni Genève. And you served as the vice president of the Swiss National um, COVID-19 Task Force. And of course, at that period, you have been very much the voice of reason in the Swiss media. You have been speaking out quite a lot on Twitter, but also on the media in, in different ways. Um, but you're also very vocal on the social media on other different issues, on other issues, on climate change, on refugees' rights. Um, you recently also Rupa has mentioned, you know, the Supreme Court decision, you spoke about Roe versus Wade uh, case and the decision there, so you did speak out. So why did you as a woman also specialize on ethics and why do you speak out? And you're not afraid, you just speak out. Yeah, so to be honest, uh, thank you for this wonderful question. To be honest, I think it began with aiming my birthday exactly right. Um, my mother left the United States where she could not vote because she was black at the time and came to marry my father in Switzerland where she could not vote because she was a woman. And I am a daughter of 1971. I was born a few months after Swiss women got the vote. So when you say, how come I speak out? It's being a part of this generation was a big thing, I think. We have to acknowledge that. Now, why did I go into bioethics? Um, I think just like every colleague of mine in medicine choose the challenges that they find the most interesting. I chose bioethics because I found the moral dilemmas, the moral challenges, the most interesting. Actually facing moral issues, clarifying what's what, uh, thinking through them, helping others to think through them. All of that provides a chance to defend things that matter. Uh, and that is why, that's why I went in there actually. I, I started, I have a medical background. I started in internal medicine. I worked in obstetrics and gynecology as well. This was the time when doing general practice enabled you to do different things. Um, I worked uh, in tropical medicine during my studies. So I actually was interested in global health way before I was interested in ethics of global health. Um, and uh, I came back from these, from these experiences uh, with more motivation uh, for women's issues rather than less. Uh, I had grown up at, at a time when you could have the illusion that this was a fight of the past. And I have to say, by the way, uh, Ilona Kutbush, I think some of the younger generations who were sometimes not very kind to 1968 feminists have a few apologies to provide since last Friday. Um, but uh, <laughs> The uh, when I when I came out of uh, when I came out of this clinical experience, I was more motivated uh, rather than less. Now, when you when you ask 
what motivates me as a woman? I don't know how to answer the question, to be honest. Um, I hope I, I don't do this specifically as a woman, or at least I don't think there's a motivation behind this that our culture stereotypically associates with, um, with being female. Uh, I may have gone into medicine, by the way, for reasons that our culture typically associates with being female, like the wish to care for and to help others. I remember one of my professors of medicine telling us with tears in his eyes that there had been a day in his career when he had realized that medicine was actually a female profession. And he was a man and had to work through this acknowledgement that he was actually engaged in a woman's path. Uh, he got over it. <laughs> But uh, there are some stereotypes in our culture that are associated with the job of medicine. But um, bioethics and speaking out and defending, I should hope, is more uh, acknowledged as universally human. Very true indeed. Thank you, Samia. And so let me just move quickly also to Ava, because you are also a medical student now. So, you know, Samia had a history of being a medical student at some point back. You are a student now, and you are a part of the Medicine Gender and Equity Working Group here at the UNIGENEF. And you're really looking at the notions of sex and gender in the medical curriculum. So what did trigger your interest in that particular area and that topic and that combination and that, you know, that notions of sex and gender in the curriculum? Thank you for the question. So, as you said, I am a fourth year medical student. And so this year for my master degree, I started a project under the supervision of Angèle Gaillard-Rigon who is the co-coordinate of the Gender Medicine and Equity Group. And so we wanted to do a survey for medical students on to aim to assess the current education that we have here in the University of Geneva on the notions of sex and gender. And what motivated me was many discussions I had actually with fellow medical students or friends in the medical field on the lack of formation that we have on many subjects like question about woman health and gender in general. Um, we do have actually many classes that aim to sensibilize us at precision medicine and how every patient is different. They have their own specificity depending on their gender, their ethnicity, their social class, et cetera, and how we should always take it into account and put it into our practice. But we feel more like it is a sensibilization and less a real formation or a real education that teach us how to put it practically into your practice and how to adapt our care for some patients. Because for example, we are taught that myocardial infarctus has an atypical presentation in women, but we are not really taught what the symptoms are or how to spot it. And so we know that many women die every year because of lack of diagnosis or misdiagnosis. And there's many examples like this. Uh, another would be gender biases. We know that they exist and we are taught that we should be aware of that, but we lack resources or sometimes students like myself, we've started working with patients and we found ourselves in a situation where we can feel the lack of evidence-based medicine or research or papers that focus specifically on women's health and that maybe just not simply incorporate women in their research and only choose a population of men and they base their results and recommendation on that. And so there's not specificity for women. And so for me, uh, as a woman, as a feminist, it can be frustrating sometimes to feel stuck, to feel like we could do more, we could know more and help more if we had more resources, more knowledge for women health. And I see many associations for my fellow students here in Geneva who are working on women health, on sensibilization for the population about periods, sexual education, or many other things. So I see the, I see the impact it can have, and I'm very happy to see the mobilization of many students. And I see that the enthusiasm is there. So I can only hope that if we had more resources, more education, more knowledge, we could do so many more things. So I really hope that Women in Global House could really uh, support that and help with that. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah, for pointing out the gaps as well. And I'm sure we come back to that also in the course of, of this event. But I, it, it's really nice to hear all of those your experiences from where you are coming. And I, it, it is inspiring for us all, I think, uh, as we listen to you. And 
I do want to go to, now to into a second round in a very quick round because I know time is very limited. So I have to, we have to be rather short. And I, I really want to look and focus now around. So what next for Women in Global Health Switzerland? What next for you all? What do you think are the next steps? And I, I'd like to start with Nora again. I know that Nora, you need to leave us um, rather quickly. So, you know, you're working at, at the global level, you're working at the national level, you are between these levels. So how do you see what is for you in this dual function, you know, and we are in Women in Global Health Switzerland, so it's domestic, it's the Swiss chapter. Um, we have heard about sometimes this dual function as well. So how do you see, what are the urgent issues for you that Women in Global Health Switzerland should actually address? Well, thank you. I, um, I always feel that um, we have a tendency, at least in Switzerland, to separate international and national levels and then have to discuss on how to organize the flow or the, the interlinkages between, between both dimensions. And I, I do feel that, um, as in health, it is more complex than that. And I do feel that uh, the Swiss chapter can really play a role into bring different perspectives together, different experiences together, linking it, uh, the national dimension, the regional dimension, the, the international dimension. For me, it, it really is a chance to do something that we can use this flow, lose the, use the dynamic and really try to build on the different, different experiences where we have. I was uh, reading in the chat on the, all the different backgrounds and 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 work that all of us are doing with fully different backgrounds completely different paths also personal path and i really feel that we should bring this diversity together and and try to build on that and then um, have it use it to uh, to influence the political decisions we we want to uh, be taken be it in switzerland around us uh, or globally and i i feel that it's the first kick off for the first meeting of, uh, of a bigger interaction. I'm really looking forward to it and be uh, uh, not just happy to participate, but I always find it very inspiring to not just hear the different perspectives, but bring the different angles together and try to um, knit them together for the, for, for the better good. Yeah, thank you so much, Nora, for joining. And thank you for pointing out that there is a flow between the global and the domestic, and it actually links together. It's not just a separation, but and, and that we need to use also the diversity we have um, here in Switzerland, the backgrounds um, to influence policy. I think it is an important element. And thank you so much for joining. I know that you can't stay on until the end. So thanks and good luck to you. Um, and, and let me with this, uh, let me move to, um, to Ava, maybe now. Ava, because you are young, you're coming in as a young professional. So what are your expectations from Women in Global Health Switzerland? So when you asked me this question, I thought, what is, I think, the most important part for me? And I think that for me, prevention and promotion of health should always be a pillar in medical practice. And in French, we say mieux vaut prévenir que guérir, so better prevent than heal. And I think it is really true, especially for women, because I feel like in women's health, there is a whole part that stays taboo or unknown still today. For example, gynecological pathology, endometriosis, or general aspects. Like I said before, the presentation of myocardial in practice, we don't know the symptoms. And I think access for women should be prim primordial access to medical treatment, to early screening, and to knowledge mostly through science popularization. It will be awesome to have more good resources for women who maybe can't easily go to a doctor or won't go for any reasons. And so they go to internet and maybe not find the best information or the wrong information. And so I think knowledge is power. And so better resources would be really good to just give education to the general population to, of women and more knowledge about their body, their health, and also better education for the medical professional, the students, to be aware of the barrier that can exist and all the specificity about a woman's health. 
Yeah, thanks, Ava, to, to mention that. And of course, access to knowledge, the education, better resources are so important. And it does bring me now again back to Sonia, maybe. Sonia, you are in, in academia, you work in academia, but you also work in different contexts. You come out of different contexts, as you have, have shared with us. Um, but I do want to bring you home here to Switzerland. Um, you work a lot in Africa. You have a background with Africa, a special relationship. But bringing you back here, as we talk about power and privilege, we are privileged here in many ways here in Switzerland. So what do you see as the biggest needs um, for women that we should address as women in global health Switzerland? Sorry, you muted, Sonia. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, I see actually two strands here. One is um, maybe just to, to link to what um, Ava has said, uh, one is um, really the, um, the field of uh, medical sciences. Right now, I think it's really a good time. We have many opportunities um, that we can, um, where we can tap in. So there are many students now at uh, Swiss universities, medical students who are very active uh, in the field of gender and health but also around uh, diversity inclusion or around social medicine. And at the same time, there is the revision of the profiles curriculum, which is the medical curriculum for, um, for Switzerland. So this uh, gives us really now a chance to, um, to tap in and to make some uh, things change in medical education. And um, um, you might be aware that there is a Swiss uh, network um, uh, gender and health research network um, and with this network um, through all these uh, activities over the past years there was a revival of this network leading into a project um, that is funded by Swiss universities right now which is um, the revision of the curriculum towards the inclusion of sex and gender in the medical curriculum where um, all Swiss medical faculties are currently engaged in. So I think that's really um, something that is going on where we capi could capitalize on a lot of interest that has been around these topics and where we probably can even build um, stronger networks, stronger links between the different universities. On the other hand, I think in Switzerland generally, we, we do also have problems um, related um, to gendered um, poverty issues. Poverty um, is maybe an odd uh, word to use in the Swiss context, but nonetheless, we know that um, women do carry the higher burden of poverty in Switzerland as well. And there are some um, of the reasons for this are um, linked to um, gendered, um, the gendered work life. So women work more part-time earn less, have less social um, insurance later on in um, pension um, age. After a divorce, women, if they have uh, the children after a separation with them, they're most uh, likely, or they're, they're at risk um, to, um, to uh, be, uh, to, tr to move into poverty in Switzerland and so on. So there are a lot of um, practical issues uh, that are linked to women's um, work, um, career development, and so on, where we do have many obstacles um, that we still uh, need to overcome. And uh, in the end, uh, this does uh, affect women's health and well-being. Maybe that's... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sonia, for that, uh, for pointing all of this out. And I saw, Sonia, you're nodding your heads, you know, in all sorts of directions. <laughs> so I let me come to you, because you have researched on the implicit bias, and you have also worked on the gender perspective around um, the effects of, of, you know, on the, with the task force, you have issued, you published a report on the gender effects on public representation and power, you know, reinforcing actually male expertise we have worked on on this particular perspective also with the COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19. So how could women in global health Switzerland address this gender bias, you know, the gender defects, um, including also the implicit bias? 
in community health and also in the healthcare system in Switzerland. I think it boils down to, to two things, uh, information and network um, information. Why? Because I meet way too much misunderstanding around implicit biases. So I'm going to give a very, very short, pretty uh, implicit biases. They happen because we are cultural sponges, uh, we human beings. And when our culture stereotypes or devalues a group, we tend to imbibe this stereotype or this devaluing. Even if we're a member of that group, that is what some people find paradoxical, but we are members of our culture. And there's really currently, if you summarize the evidence, there is currently no really effective way of countering the bias in our heads and in our hearts. But one of the things that the research from my team shows is that there are circumstances where we can limit their effects on our behavior. And I think that this is what we have to shoot for. This is where the network comes in. Um, because it, in order to see how to limit the effects of biases on our behavior, we have to first identify everywhere where this, in, where this influence happens. And you begin to see it everywhere. <laughs> it is really scary. Um, when you start to think about what it would take to limit these effects, um, it becomes a very, very, very tall order. It can be completely daunting. But this is the identification of the task we have. And so a network is absolutely essential. There are many people attempting to limit the effects of these biases on our behavior here and there in their own way. And I, my impression is that many of these people are feeling very lonely. <laughs> and to know that there are others attempting the same or similar things elsewhere and that they, they can become allies, that they can learn from each other and support one another is going to be absolutely crucial. So I think this is one of my big expectations from women in global health is that it could help people find others when they might have felt very alone in the world before. I have to add one thing because uh, about biases, just as an aside about biases, one of the stereotypes, perhaps even stronger in Swiss culture about women is that we don't get angry. Um, Swiss culture devalues anger in general, but even more in men. And one of the results is I see female colleagues who have lost uh, even sometimes it seems the ability to, to feel anger. Uh, this has to be fought. It is quite okay to not want to express anger. If you live in a culture that devalues that, that's fine. But you should be able to feel it because anger, as an ethicist, I have to say, points us to values that are transgressed. It is a perception tool. It shows us where one of our values that matter is being violated. And so we have to be able to identify these points uh, in time and space. And for that, we need to reconcile ourselves with anger. Thank you, Samia, for pointing all of that out, because I think values are so important also for women in global health as such. And I think emotions are part of that, right? So it, it's good to point that out, but also to point out that, in fact, it is about the movement to bring us together and so to fight together, so to speak, the biases we, we find in Swiss society. And, and Ilona, in some ways, you have mentioned at the very beginning, I'll, I'll come to you at the end, but you have also at the beginning started and said, you know, you, you, you experience the biases all throughout your life um, in different moments in your stages of life. So what from these different experiences you had, what are the lessons learned and also from your involvement in the movement, in women in global health, other movements, but also in women in global health as a movement, what are the lessons learned that you can share with us, which we can translate into the Swiss context? Where do you see our opportunities as, as women in global health in Switzerland? Well, that's a tall order. Thank you very much, Michaela. Uh, just to say uh, in uh, respect to what Samia just said, I get angry a lot. And uh, I love being uh, this angry old woman because, uh, you know, it really needs that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, take up a few points that then also relate to what one can do in Switzerland. One, it's already been said, but it's so important grow the network, grow the network, grow the network. Uh, it's, you know, supporting each other. And Switzerland is special because it is so international. We've heard about all the international students. We hear in Germany how all the Germans are going to Switzerland to work in the health system and at their universities. 
We have all the international women in Geneva, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, no other country has the opportunity to actually, as a national chapter, to be so global and also to support one another. Uh, because I believe many of these international women that are in uh, Switzerland perhaps uh, ha are not finding it so easy uh, to be integrated, to be part, etc. And I think, you know, this is a challenge and could be an enormous strength. And it's an enormous strength of capacity, of intellectuality, of research, of knowledge uh, that I think one should bring together from all parts of the world. Switzerland is so unique and one needs to exploit that. I think I'd also like to highlight the political dimension that's so important. And so many important decisions in Switzerland because of its uh, uh, political organization are taken by the Swiss parliament. I'm sort of thinking of the development strategy of Switzerland, for example. So I would hope that uh, the, the Swiss chapter makes a special effort to reach out to female parliamentarians uh, in Switzerland to work with them. So, you know, we have the link uh, with Nora into the administration, et cetera. But I think, you know, really reaching out to parliament is important. I think in relation to one point that Ava raised, the outreach to pharmaceutical companies, to women working in pharmaceutical companies is absolutely essential. The WEF uh, did a very important study that showed where there is more female leadership in uh, pharmaceutical companies, not only do they earn more money, that's one side of things, but the other side is they do different types of research, exactly what you said, Ava. Uh, they uh, look at women as you know, part of the research, the issues they face as part of the challenges to be taken up by the industry. And I think you know, that is something with you know, all the critique many of us might have of pharmaceutical companies, but to actually look out and uh, have an exchange with some of the extraordinary women that are also in these companies could be quite important. And two more things perhaps that, that I would see. The essential thing is while building a movement is that everyone does what is necessary in one's own backyard. So every day to sort of say, you know, in what I'm doing, am I actually promoting this issue of, of women's health? I often find myself in a situation that I scratch my head and I say, gosh, you know, why didn't I suggest this? Why didn't I ask for a project like this? Why didn't I answer in, in that way? So all these small actions, you know, like the network uh, make a large whole. And I think therefore that is so important. It requires courage sometimes, you know, but uh, I call that, you know, being like a duck that, you know, you just have to shake yourself afterwards and, and continue. And my last point is to show that women in global health is also about the really large issues in our society. I would say, you know, women in global health has to take up issues like planetary health, the environmental challenge, the climate change, the impact on women in poor countries is just dreadful. Think of water, think of heat, think of cooking, think of food, think of hunger, all of that, unless we as women in global health are engaging 150% in planetary health, we're not doing our job. And that would perhaps be my uh, last message. Thank you so much, Ilona, for this, these different messages. In fact, there's a lot of work ahead of us. That's very clear. A lot of action to be done. All of us to be brought together. We can't do it alone. We need all of you. And we hope that you will support us and continue to support us. And all of you who are with us today at, in, in this event, in this inaugural event. But let me thank you all for joining this, this panel and for this discussion. Thank you so much for being so open and sharing with you the experiences with, uh, with us um, and inspiring us all along. With this, I'd like to hand back to Gabrielle for the last part because that's really where the action lies. So 
we are looking at the different work streams which are, which are with us in Women in Global Health System. Thank you, Michaela, and uh, thank you so much to all the, the panel discussion uh, participants. I think we were all inspired and excited uh, with a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so now we're going to move into the next segment um, of, of, of this launch event, um, where we're actually going to, in as much as possible, try and harvest your ideas. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, you know, with the group, with the core group of, of women in global health in Switzerland, we've been discussing the Swiss aspect um, of our strategy. Now, whether that be advocacy work or getting data and putting it out there or putting projects together, at this stage, what we'd really like to do is just kind of hone in on the key topics that we have felt that, uh, that, that maybe need a little bit of exploration. And so what we're going to do is you'll hear just a, you know, a quick pitch from one of our, from one of our core group mem members on one of four topics. Um, there may be more and maybe you'll have other ideas, but what we'd really like for you to do is to listen to the quick pitch around the topic area. There will be a question to kind of inspire you, but just please in the chat as much as possible, flush us out with all of your ideas, because what we really like to do is take those ideas and, and, and get our homework done and then come back to you and try and move these forward through events or through other activities that we'd like to set up, whether that be on our platform and we'll, um, we'll send you the link to, to sign up to the platform, which is where we'd like to communicate or through other activities, whether hopefully some of them will be in person and in different languages, but that's where we are today. So what I'd like to do now is um, first introduce you to Dr. Frédéric Jacquerio, uh, who will give us a quick idea of what our thinking is around the issue of gender equity and leadership here in Switzerland. So please get ready on the chat and, and let us know what you think. Frédéric, over to you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, that was really an amazing panel. Thank you for all the inspiring um, discussion. So to um, start on gender equity and leadership, the first priority, I would like to share a few thoughts. Um, as you all observe, governance for the COVID-19 pandemic uh, management has been largely dominated by men. Um, for instance, in, uh, in Switzerland, the National COVID-19 Science Task Force was constituted of 25 members. Uh, we have the chance today to have one of them. Uh, there was only seven women on the, on the task force, uh, only one woman with expertise uh, on gender diversity issues. And globally, we also know that the majority of the healthcare workforce uh, is women, nearly three quarters, even more if we look at nursing and midwifery. But the decision are being taken by men occupying 75% of leadership position. I think many of you touch about that um, in the panel. And it is likely the same here in Switzerland. And I would like to give an example in my field as a doctor. Um, we, we know that the majority of persons entering the medical profession uh, nowadays are interns um, that are women. But the higher we go up the ladder, we see women become less and less visible. In the hospital and clinic in Switzerland, this is a fact uh, there is just a little over 15% of senior residents as women uh, today. So I suppose that's the question for all the panel who want to understand why and the audience too. Um, and Women in Global Health Switzerland aims at focusing on such issue by getting and analyzing the data. So the, the question would be, what are the barriers and challenges in achieving more gender equity in leadership and decisional position for the next crisis pandemic in this country? Thank you so much, Frederic. So we'd really like to hear your thoughts around this one uh, strategic area. I'm also going to launch a poll right now to kind of uh, elicit your responses um, on, on this issue. So please keep your thoughts coming on this and I'll give it just a minute while I actually prepare to introduce the next topic. Um, so please give us your thoughts, whether or not it's a topic that you'd like to um, take part in, um, whether you would like to contribute in any way and what your thoughts are, um, and maybe things that we haven't thought about. Certainly there are things that we haven't thought about at this stage. So please help us to shape this particular um, work stream that we'd like to focus on. So now, um, as we let the poll kind of keep on going, I will, to keep the dynamic up, thank you so much, Frédéric. Um, I'd like to go on to the second topic area, 
um, which is basically supporting young women in global health uh, in Switzerland. So young women professionals, whether coming out of you know, the student life, first job entry and, and those early stages of career. So um, Tori Arawade, who is working with FINE, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics, is going to present this topic to us now. So please, um, Tori, take the floor. Thank you. Hello, nice to meet everyone. And I'm happy there's so much people involved today. Um, I think it's a really good thing to put these ideas forward and hopefully get your feedback. So I'm Tori, I'm working under the Young Professionals Group for Women in Global Health. And one of the advantages I feel about this is that we're able to change the future. We have a crucial element being a young professional is that we have time. So right now we can clearly see that the current space right now is a lot, very difficult for women, especially with what's happening in America at the moment. And I think WGH Switzerland is a good opportunity for us to get together, be around like-minded individuals and hopefully support each other through this space and navigating through it. So. A huge part of this, as Gabrielle said, was enacting men mentorships, creating targeted internships, maybe some networking and workshops that can really offer support to young women as they begin their professional careers. So we would very much be happy to get women involved in this, especially if they need support when navigating the space in Switzerland. Um, another important thing for me that was alluded earlier with some of the speakers is the importance for us to mobilize together and not work in silos. So I really hope that we're able to get that out for the young professionals in Switzerland. And last, again, being with Women in Global Health Switzerland, it's important to not just try and enact change within the Swiss borders, but also think about the impact outside of Switzerland as well. So nice to meet everyone. And then one question I have is, what is the importance of mobilizing the youth to you all? And what is the benef benefits of working together versus working in silos? So again, it's important, I think, to merge our voices together when hoping to create change, but I'm very interested in your feedback as well. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you so much, Tori, and uh, really, really great points, and also some really specific ideas that we'd like to also um, elicit everyone's kind of, uh, you know, thoughts about. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll around support to young women professionals. So please um, either put your ideas in the chat, whether they be specific, whether or not you want to participate in this area with us, um, and uh, or partner and let us know what you think. So that's, um, that's really important. So I can see some of the, um, the answers coming in. Thanks so much, Tori. So what I'd like to do now is as you're still thinking, I know this is kind of a, it's a, it's a bit speedy, um, but we thought maybe let's just get the ideas out there and give you time to sort of metabolize them and maybe come back to us. Um, but now we would like to move to the third topic, which is gender in Swiss um, health policy making. Um, and so I'd like to um, ask Helen um, Preterch from Swiss P TPH, who's also in the core group with us, as is Tori as well, and Frederic, uh, to, to give us the initial thoughts around um, the activities in health policy and development policy in Switzerland. Thanks very much, Gabriella, and really a, pleasant, a pleasure to be here. And thanks to all the panel speakers, it's been uh, really inspiring so far. I think with this work stream, um, just to say that this, in this context, we really want to ensure that a gender equity lens is applied to the international and the Swiss health and policy development making, um, health and policy policy making. So really at home and abroad. And I think this is really timely. We have the upcoming renewal of the Swiss development policy also different uh, Swiss national documents on the horizon to be updated. Um, and this is really a critical way because we're seeing that policy development, having these written strategic and policy documents, that's really an anchor course, having the policy doesn't mean that everything gets put into practice, but it provides that critical, it provides the anchor, a critical leverage uh, for making sure that transformations happen. And it's also really key to have the right people around the table when policies are developed, when they're consulted, uh, and to make sure that these processes not only give attention to gender, of course, that's, that's where we're coming from, but that they're fully inclusive more generally. 
So we really see that there's a lot of power and privilege comes into play with policy making and that this is really something that we need to engage with, looking at the international scene, also looking at the situation of public health and uh, clinical practice within Switzerland itself. I think it's also essential to keep in mind that we're also looking for evidence-based policy making. So I think that's the other piece that comes in, looking to see that the information, the data that's leveraged for making policy. And we really see this as a key area. I think there's been some discussion now about kind of the unique position of Switzerland, as the, all the capacities that we have in Global Geneva. So really an area where there can be learning and exchange and we can benefit between the global level and the Swiss policy development as well. I think there's been some great exchanges already in the chat and I think um, we have different people already engaging. So I think Claire Summerfield has spoken out about the whole question of insurance. We've got Marta there as head of policy at Gavi. So I think tremendous resources uh, and huge capacities here and really looking forward to being involved in this activity as we move forward. Great, thank you so much, Helen. Um, really good points that you've made. So um, there are some discussions in the chat and, and I've just launched the poll. So please let us know what you feel about these areas. Um, and again, whether or not this is an area that you would like to, to, to work with us on. Um, so please keep your thoughts coming. Thanks so much, Helen. So now as you, as you fill out this poll, we'll go to the, the, the final of the four that we wanted to introduce today. Doesn't mean that it will only be these four topic areas, but these are the ones that we wanted to just get your feedback and input on today. Um, so the next area is gender, sex and gender in research and development field in, in Switzerland. Um, and so I'd like to ask Andrea Lucao from Medicines for Malaria Venture to talk us through that point. Andrea, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, in the early discussions that we were having around in the women in global health, we really were talking about what is it that Switzerland, um, what's, what's quite unique about Switzerland um, that we need to we need to make sure that not just for ourselves but for the rest of the world that we can bring this to other women in global health chapters and other women around the world. And as multiple panelists have spoken about, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and R and D is a really really important part of the Swiss economy. It's um, some 30% of our exports. We actually export more in the pharmaceutical uh, area than chocolates, watches, and, and, um, and clocks combined. Um, so this is really an area that is a, it's a major employer, um, and it's a really major, Im we have major impact in the rest of the world. I'm delighted to see that some of our pharmaceutical um, colleagues are on, the, are on the line because this is clearly an area for large pharmaceuticals. Um, it's also a really important area for small and medium sized enterprises. Um, and then, as we've noted, um, the, the World Health Organization um, here, as well as a really vibrant um, uh, entrepreneurial area, Tech for Eva, which is currently giving um, grants for technology in women's, in women's health. Um, and then the not-for-profit pharmaceutical area. So in areas like the Women's Brain Project, which is working in mental health, the Concept Foundation, which is doing a hugely important work in pregnancy and contraception. And those of us who are working in the not for, in the uh, areas, um, uh, diseases of poverty. So there is quite an ecosystem that is here. Many of us um, are in fact women in these, in these organizations or um, very uh, firmly allied male uh, counterparts. And understanding um, the real question that we had, I think um, at Women in Global Health is for Switzerland is how can we best leverage the, the, the pharmaceutical might the work of the WHO, and I saw multiple colleagues from WHO here as well, what is it that we need to do collectively that will allow us to gather better data on women and women's health products, make sure that our policies are are in keeping with the best practices globally, make sure that the products that we're exporting to the rest of the world have the, have the, um, the values, um, the ability to cure and to treat in the ways that we need to do by gathering correct data. So I would very much like to see uh, from this group some ideas about how do we gather ourselves in a very fragmented system 
for-profit, not-for-profit, WHO, women's health, reproductive health, and diseases that are not just those of women, to, um, to gather ourselves together and make our collective knowledge data gathering and voices heard. Great, thank you so much, Andrea. So while everyone sort of starts to, you know, to think that through, what I'll do is I'm gonna just quickly show the results from the previous poll and I'll launch the new one that has to do with this important topic that you've just talked us through. Thank you so much. So please everyone think, think that through. Indeed, we have a, a whole landscape uh, to, to put around the table and think these issues through around uh, R&D and product development. Thank you so much, Andrea. And uh, so to everyone in the audience, please, please think it through. Let us know how you want to engage on this issue with us. And so um, while we now are filling in this last poll, um, what I'd like to do now is as we come to a, a sort of close, um, ask perhaps uh, Helen to wrap up this amazing session. <laughs> and I've got one last poll for everyone that I'll put out at the end. Um, so thank you everyone and Helen over to you. Thank you very much. Not very easy to bring this session to a close. I think it's really marking the start and we'd really like to thank each and every one of you for your participation, having taken the time. We're really excited about the outlook for women in global health in Switzerland. Also for these four work streams, I think we've put those out there as suggestions where we see that really there's a lot of energy to move things forward, but the sky's the limit. I think you may also have other ideas. We really would like you to engage with them. Of course, this whole network, this movement, it really lives from activities of the members and your um, and opportunities that you're able to provide as well. So we would really like to ask you to engage on the platform and we will be moving more to have these kind of discussions on the platform as well, also just to, to keep it manageable and to get everybody in touch with one another. I think there's important networking potential there. We're also really looking to see the whole of Switzerland represented in this chapter. Um, so I think there's a huge diversity of geographies and of languages. It's been spoken about there's the global aspects, the Swiss aspects, the Swiss public health, the, the clinical. People have raised about the importance of involving patients. Um, so I think we're really not there yet. I think Dena has also raised it as well. Um, maybe we did quite well in terms of age. I mean, we have young uh, colleagues, we have older ones. And uh, so that maybe uh, we, we made some progress there but I think really it was flagged also in terms of ethnicity and women that are facing other barriers be this living with uh, disabilities insecure migratory status in, in, in Switzerland sexual orientation so there would be many other uh, factors as well that I think we really need to look at together because it is the idea that we have a really uh, inclusive Swiss chapter this would really be our ambition so so please also help us to move forward that part of the agenda as well. In this regard, I would like to say that um, we do see that all of us have a lot of resources that will all, all be able to move the different agendas forward. I wanted to flag that there will be a next event upcoming that we're also going to host at the Swiss TPH so that also the, the German part of Switzerland gets a uh, gets a, a say in all of this. It will be an in-person event. I think um, Carmen is going to put the link into the chat. There's also going to be information upcoming about it on the platform, um, also on our website. Um, so it's really a, a networking event focused on sharing experiences around different career journeys and pathways in global health, um, followed by yeah, a simple get together and having a drink together. So we'll be looking at experiences um, from uh, Lujain Al-Chabani, I think she's maybe also here. So someone who made the transition from doing a master's to taking the decision to do a PhD in global health. Um, also Anya Junka, so someone with a clinic, clinical background who's worked in NGO settings and making the transition then to moving into a more academic institution. Uh, so it'll be yeah a kind of speed, speed dating event, if you like, one hour with 
exchanges, opportunity to exchange with different women working in global health, sharing their stories and having them available to exchange and be able to provide advice. So that was a small plug for a next upcoming event. We hope there'll be many more events, really a warm invitation to all of you to take this as an opportunity and to engage on the platform and also really that we have some in-person meetings as well and really see the movement moving forward from here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. So indeed, we've got a first event around one of the, the key focus areas. As we said, maybe there are others and those will arise with time and with your engagement. Uh, ideally, we'd like to have one key event uh, per uh, work stream per year. Uh, so you'll be hearing more from us on, on the other areas, notably once we've sort of re um, harvested all of your ideas and feedback. Um, so with this and on behalf of, of all of the core group of women in global health Switzerland and the extended core group of, of engaged women who've been working with us, all of the speakers who took of your time and your, and your sensitive thought processes and shared those with us and your experiences, um, we'd like to thank you so much for joining. We're very excited um, and we're ready to take this forward. You'll hear more from us soon. <laughs>